including some work I did with Ling Golson at the University of Alaska Museum in Fairbanks. So MAM will show an astounding disparity of size, habitat, diet, and along with this comes a lot of different ways of getting around, right? So certain mammals, though, smaller mammals, have adaptations that are just unmistakable. Like you obviously know what they're doing, such as this Jerboa in the upper left that obviously jumps around, or this marsupial mole in the bottom left that is obviously a burrowing species. But the reality, when you look across mammals, you get a lot more things that look like this, just kind of small, inconspicuous in color, and a lot of times these things are broadly termed generalist. But we know they have to be doing different things. And within their communities, they're partitioning space differently, and within their families, they're doing different things. So how do we begin to understand a little bit about this? I think the idea is to add in some behavioral information, morphology, and ecology to the mix. So in other vertebrate systems, we have a nice suite of morphological measurements that are commonly used to explain a little bit about the interaction with morphology and behavior and ecology, such as birds, uh, the simple Beak shape, tarsus length, wing aspect ratio can infer something about the level of the canopy that flies around him. Or in reptiles, the squat mates there is a system of morphological measurements that are pretty standardized, that have been used across various groups like the skink here, or more famously, anolis lizards. Um, and these have helped explain lots of large macroevolutionary patterns about life on the planet, such as how species interactions drive phenotypic variation, or of course, convergent evolution across different island systems or other communities. But with mammals, historically, a lot of our work's been really qualitative, and it's focused on a few specific topics, like the origin of climbing in mammals, um, such as a shift for primates from the ground up to the trees. And of course, trying to infer something about the behavior of extinct taxa as well. But a lot of times we'll use things like, you know, relative shape of the bone, or it appears to be more curved in this place or that. And we don't really have a good set of quantitative measurements for this kind of work. And I think this is mainly for three real reasons. Um, the first one really is just the history of the field. In mammalogy, so much of our focus has traditionally always been on skulls and skull morphology, which is cool because skulls tell us a lot about diet, um, systematics, still commonly used for that. Teeth fossilize really well and are really different among different families. Um, but they don't tell us really anything about, or much about how the animal interacts with this environment. And when we prepare study skins, traditionally the skeleton is actually just either tossed out or frequently damaged in the preparation. And we're left with the study skin, which is useful, but retains no repeatable morphological measurements. Unlike a bird, where you can go back and measure feathers, uh, we can't really do that with mammals, unfortunately. So size is also kind of an issue in mammals. Um, there's this idea that small body species may not be as morphologically diverse as um, so take this mouse limb into account, 30 gram primate, smallest primate. Uh, look at it on the branch. The branch appears to be a pretty flat surface to an animal of this size, compared to some other lemurs like an injury or maybe uh, uh, some other primates like a howler monkey or an orangutan or something. They have a really different way of interacting with this tiny little branch, right? They need much, typically longer fingers, more powerful grasp to support that kind of body weight. And larger body species might have more Right? So if this mouse lever falls from a tree, it hits terminal velocity, bounces off the ground, and it walks away. Uh, an orangutan or an injury or something, that's not really what happens. This, amongst primatologists, has been called the splat effect, um, which is a real thing. And actually seems to show up in empirical data in these kind of analyses. So this discriminant function of, um, of rodent morphology, done from Sam Mills and Ben Volkerberg in 2008, and if you look right here, there's a lot of overlap between terrestrial and arboreal species, and some semi-aquatic species as well. And if you dig in their data, all of these are the smallest ones in their entire analysis. Um, a guy named Ferris Jenkins, a, a paleontologist, hypothesized that uh, a lot, to a small mammal, um, the world really is kind of an arboreal place. You have to climb and, and move through this matrix, so it's really not that different from being on the ground or up in a tree. Kind of compelling hypothesis. And it's something we have to think about because 44% of small, non uh, volant mammals are less than 100 grams. I think the real big problem we're dealing with is the fact we still don't really know what a lot of mammals are doing. They're nocturnal, they don't like to be seen, and a lot of our behavioral information comes from historical accounts from the 18th, 19th, 20th century. Um, 
And they don't always read our books to see what they're supposed to be doing either, right? A good example of this is a northern redback wolf that Link and I have worked with. It's incredibly abundant in many parts of its range. It's whole arctic, um, certain polar distribution. Thousands of publications on this species. But we received this anecdotal information that the species was actually climbing in trees. So we went to investigate that a little bit more. We're actually pretty surprised with what we found. Um, there's a bull to the left of the arrow. So it's about, it's, it's a bull up in a white spruce tree in Fairbanks. It's about 20 below zero that day. And it actually was climbing up in a tree to forage on lichen. Um, bulls aren't supposed to do this, or this species of bull wasn't supposed to do this. Um, so they weren't supposed to be climbing at all. So this is really cool. So this is undocumented behavior. It's sort of a testament to the fact that we really, even for the most common species, can often be surprised about what they do. So working with bulls got me interested in just the subfamily, Arbicolini. So it's the rodent, sub, the rodents, um, Chrysidides of the family. It's about 150 species, a pretty rapid radiation. Um, but when you look at this group, you don't think variation, right? This is a lot of round, short-limbed, kind of relatively uninteresting looking mammals. Something that's really easy to pass off as generalist. But the fact is they do a lot of different things. We have fully arboreal species. We have semi-aquatic species across the tree. We have uh, even some fossorial species. So I thought it's a good group to look at some of these questions in the context of some of the ideas I presented earlier, like do we actually find postcranial disparity in these small mammals? Um, and do any of these possibly relate to function? So I selected five species that represent sort of a continuum between climbing and furrowing. Um, and all five of these are species I had access to the full postcranial skeleton for. Uh, which isn't always um, the case with a lot of these. And also we have a pretty good idea of what a lot of these species are doing. So I feel confident in, in this continuum that I drew up here. So I have to recognize that the small number of species precludes any sort of phylogenetic correctness um, in, in this sort of study. But again, this is sort of a first pass to just examine if any morphological variation is there. Once the sample size is increased, the phylogeny can be taken into account. Taken into account. So we have these measurements that have been published in a few different papers um, um, for mammal morphology um, of indices. So it's a lot of length by width type measurements. So you measure the length of a bone and its width, and then you can say something about the size of it or the shape of it. Um, so I used these, and I did 25 postcranial measurements for 47 individuals of all five of these species. And from these 25 measurements, I made 22 indices from the raw data, again, things like length by width. And all these were based off of previously published work. Um, I did create a couple of indices as well. So I used principal components to explore um, the variation of species. I used a covariance matrix of these raw um, ratio or index scores. I also did a couple of univariate analysis analyses as well. So this is the result of the first two components of the principal component analysis. And immediately what you see is the fact that there is variation that is associated with the species. Um, it's not just a bunch of so we are seeing variation here, which is pretty cool. Um, so the first component, about 72% of the variation, is strongly loaded with digit length. And this clearly separates our one arboreal species, way off to the right there. Um, our brand is only call it, as you can see. And the second component, about 8.5% of the variation, is mostly based around, most of the loadings are based around forearm robusticity. And this actually separates an orange, uh, Microtus pinatorum, the fully semi fossorial species, and as well as Microtus montanus is pink, which also furrows a lot in its alpine habitat. So these are actually the, the indices themselves. Uh, so on top is a relative finger length, on the bottom is relative toe length. And you can see clearly that this arboreal species has a lot longer fingers and toes than the rest of them, right? And this isn't something that we're that surprised by. Um, you find this in squirrels, for example. Tree squirrels have longer digits than um, ground squirrels. But again, taking the fact that all these are less than 60 grams, average weight probably about 30 grams, um, didn't necessarily expect to find this kind of variation. And again, with the forearm robusticity, so these are scores of uh, the one up top is like an ulna robustness, and then the bottom one is a um, muscle attachment on the end of an ulna. 
And you see a, on the left that in orange, the planet's worm, the fossorial species, actually has a lot more robust limbs. And this actually fits pretty well um, kind of along that continuum from burrowing to climbing um, with our arboreal species have much more gracile forelimbs there on the far right. So we are seeing morphological disparity between these groups, um, these all small body creatures. Um, and some of this disparity actually does appear to be associated with some functional traits in mammals. Um, and it looks like digit proportions and forearm robustness could be pretty useful things to think about in the future for these kinds of work. So my Everdeez brutalist, this is the common northern redback bull that, that's often on the ground, but also is an agile climber. Um, it just always fell out in the middle of everything, um, which is kind of neat, because it's, it got me thinking about just this idea of uh, quantitatively assigning the term generalist to something. Um, and can we do that? Is that an appropriate way to think about being a generalist? And of course, to really pursue that, I need a lot more samples, phylogenetic corrective um, methods for lot of this work, but still an interesting thought experiment. So to finish up, um, I think a big thing I want to stress that maybe came across in this is that we need to continue reporting natural history data for these species. The only reason I was able to do an analysis like this is all, at all is because we kind of know what these species are doing. Um, natural history is no less important now than it was 300 years ago. A lot of people gloss over it in a lot of their studies, but um, the more we know about things, the more power we have. Also, using phylogenetic um, methods, of course, and also some kind of allometric scaling. And it'll be fun to um, scale up the, the sample size of this and see how those two different things sort of interact with each other in the analyses. And so I think this is really, really fertile ground for research in mammals. Um, not a lot of people have done this, look, done this in extant mammals so much. And there's, we have not only across the bull radiation, but lots of different small mammal radiations. We have some pretty striking examples of convergent evolution. And some of them are pretty predictable little morphotypes that we might expect, and some things are just really bizarre. And using new methods like micro-CT scanning, that opens up the possibility of using all these, uh, these pickled specimens that have, we haven't had access to the skeleton before. So hopefully, continuing along this line of thought can really contribute um, some more to large-scale macroevolutionary patterns across the planet. So um, thank all my collaborators, funding, and especially